Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Eunice, and that was that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> he was really funny, and I, I really enjoyed it, particularly because part of my research also deals with obesity, and that was really fascinating to hear that. Um, before I begin, I want to recognize everyone on Kumeyaay land, and um, I also want to thank everybody who made this possible. Um, I could not have possibly hoped for a better panel or a better audience to share my research with, and this is very um, preliminary for me. And I've, I've I actually haven't shared this particular research before, so I really look forward to talking about this with all of you. Um, before I share my paper in earnest, um, I would like to begin by providing a brief overview of my larger research to talk about where I'm coming from. So this particular piece is actually coming from like a larger piece of research that is revolved around the keyword digestion. And I want to talk about how I'm approaching this term digestion to sort of give more context to what I'm trying to do here. Um, my research focuses on digestion of Trans-Pacific U.S. imperialism and militarism. By Trans-Pacific, I mean both the rim and the basin, rather than focusing simply on the rim, as was actually the case for a lot of Asian American studies, which is the sort of background that I have. Um, and by digestion, I'm referring to exactly what you all are thinking. I'm thinking about the act of eating and how um, when the food enters your body, you're not only eating and ingesting, but you're digesting the material that comes into your body. Um, the key distinction here I seek to make here is um, between the passive act of ingestion or exposure versus more willful acts of eating and digestion. Through digestion, I also emphasize it is an assemblage in the form of embodiment, a way of taking apart an external and foreign substance that has entered the body and ex uh, extracting what is useful and making it its own. In this sense, digestion rejects purity and instead forms relations with substances. To take a step further, I also look at digestion through its secondary definition. And here I'm referring to how we colloquially, colloquially use the term digestion to say like, I digest this particular material. This is a, sort of a very much rhetorical sense, right? This is new information, I have mastered it, and we often say that we have digested it. Another really interesting thing to note is that it's not just in the English, English language that we do this, it actually occurs in a lot of different languages as well. Um, so I approach it both as a physical process, including physical changes that result from digestion, such as obesity to genetic changes, but also as a form of rhetorical and cultural process that makes sense of changes in order to help people continue to exist and to establish their selfhood. I emphasize digestion in order to demonstrate how imperial forces continue to slowly and subtly enact changes, even in the face of vocal opposition, but at the same time, I also highlight how people deal with changes enforced upon them by the empire and still survive. Focusing on digestion as a process of building assemblages and relationality, my research looks at three materials, meat byproducts, radiation and radioactive materials, and lastly, plastic and microplastic. This presentation homes in a part of the second section that evaluates theoretical assumptions of US imperialism and militarism in connection to how bodies digest radiation and radioactive materials by examining the work of a Marshallese poet, Kathy Daniel Kitchener. Alongside the immense ocean, low-lying vegetation carpets Runet, an islet in Inuitic Atoll in the Republic of the Marshall Islands in the central Pacific Ocean. The soft green of leaves and bushes come to an abrupt end, and a massive gray slab of concrete lies in the islet. Over 377 feet in diameter, the strange concrete disrupts the beach's smooth stretch of sandy greenery, not unlike an unidentified flying object that's made it furtive landing. Every time I look at the photo, it kind of looks like a, a UFO on an island. Underneath the concrete lies radioactive waste, including plutonium-239, plutonium fragments, as well as tons and tons of contaminated soil and debris. These radioactive materials came from 67 nuclear bombs in uh, the United States tested in the Marshall Islands from 1946 to 1958, beginning with Castle Bravo, an atomic bomb approximately a thousand times more devastating than the bomb Little Boy that was dropped on Hiroshima. Despite the devastation of these bombs, people of the Marshall Islands persevered. Radioactive fallout caused acute radi radiation sickness and radiation contaminated waters and lands. Their daily sustenance like fish and breadfruit were irradiated, but Marshallese people still ate, digested, and survived. They suffered and continued to suffer from an array of cancers, tumors, diseases, and birth defects, as well as mental, emotional, and psychological impacts. Yet they continued to live and fight against persisting radiation, as well as nuclear proliferation and global warming. 
As a response to their continued protests between 1977 and 1979, the U.S. military gathered this highly radioactive nuclear waste and dumped them into a crater called the Cactus Crater. Um, I would also like to mention here that the crater itself was also created by an atomic bomb that they tested. They then poured concrete over the crater as a flimsy band-aid over a radioactive waste dump that has a half-life of 24,000 years. Even though the concrete slab provides a visual break from the surroundings, the dome is useless in containing waste materials and radioactivity within the crater. Radioactive materials steadily seep through and permeate the soil and eventually flow into the ocean that connects not only the islets, but the atolls and eventually other land masses. I focus on the Brunet Dome to discuss the ways in which the imperial ideology of the United States and its military presents a fundamentally incompatible view to how Marshall Lee's poet Kathy General Kitchener conceptualizes the irradiated body through her poetry and activism. The ruling ideology behind constructing such a useless slab of concrete and calling it a day really encapsulates the very method of the imperial and military expansion of the U.S. as a settler colonial empire. That is, the myth of distance, <laughs> isolation, separation, and to use a tactical term, to divide and conquer. For instance, the, in the Pacific Theater of World War II, the U.S. employed the military tactic of leapfrogging, which is jumping from an island to another island as you sort of make that progress. Um, and in the conceptual groundwork for the atom bomb testing after the war, during the Cold War, the U.S. military separated an atoll from the chains of atolls that made up the Marshall Islands and drove people out of their homes and made their return impossible, which is a form of containment. On the other hand, General Kitchener puts forth an ontology of the body as one of relations, connections, and kinship. By highlighting these incommensurable perspectives, I argue that one, the Marshallese people, and to a larger extent, other affected Pacific Basin and Rim bodies digest, not simply ingest or withstand the exposure of, U.S. imperialism and militarism by directly opposing its imperial tactics. And two, perhaps more importantly, the future that Marshallese people envision stands in direct opposition to the imperial and militarized future the U.S. attempts to bring forth in the Pacific. When looking at the Runet Dome from an aerial view, it looks eerily like an island in a sea of green vegetation, just as the Runet Islet itself is surrounded by the ocean. This aerial view is an identifiably militaristic and imperial gaze that reflects colonial land-centric cartography based on terra nullius, or the myth of empty land that is ready to be conquered and settled. This stands in opposition to Marshallese navigational methods that prioritize relational positions and embodied knowledges within the journeying self. So uh, Kathy General Kitchener, the poet that I'm writing about, she also writes extensively about this journeying method and how this form of navigation is another way of understanding the relational um, self. Instead, the overlapping visual cues of an aerial view of Runet Dome as an island reflect the ostensibly, ostensible justification that the US and its military gave for selecting its nuclear testing sites. That is, it is far, it's isolated, and it is contained. Tongan scholar Epili Haofa notes this um, as what he calls, and I quote here, derogatory and belittling views of indigenous cultures, end quote, that stems from contact with European missionaries and colonizers. He states that, I, I quote here once again, according to this view, the small island states and territories of the Pacific are much too small, too poorly endowed with resources, and too isolated from the centers of economic growth. Similarly, post-colonial scholar Elizabeth Delory argues that Western imperialism fabricated the notion that islands are isolated by erasing the histories and technologies of navigation only, and only deeming navigation by European explorers as legible forms of transoceanic mobility. These perspectives of distance and isolation facilitated colonial and imperial exploitation based on the rhetoric of uneven relations between the West and Pacific Islands, from outright settler colonial conquest to economic and health exploitations through phosphate mining and circulating undesired meat byproducts. And that is sort of what I talk about in the first part of um, my research. More specific to nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands, Delory also argues that this perceived isolation gives rise to a myth of containment. She writes that, and I'm quoting here, Western colonizers had long configured tropical islands into contained spaces of a laboratory, which is to say a suppression of island history and indigenous presence. This myth of containment convinces the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission ecologist that the Marshall Islands provided a controlled environment in which they could scientifically test the effects of atomic bombs. 
Following this premise, they were testing both the blast and fallout in a controlled safe environment, like a laboratory for the advancement of knowledge for what they called, and I'm quoting here, the peace of the world and security of free men everywhere, end quote. And this is also very ironic because in the original testing of the, the Bravo testing, they always talk about how they didn't necessarily anticipate the fallout to be as expensive as it was, but they're also contra uh, contradicting discussions around that, that they actually intended it and they meant to understand the human effects of it. And that's, again, like that would go back to the U.S. understanding of Hibakusa and that sort of relationality between the basin and the rim as well. Um, the U.S. military's focus of the cleanup efforts shared this myth of isolation and containment. For example, the final stage of cleanup was termed crater entombment, um, and I'm describing this uh, through a quote, by which contaminated soil and debris would be entombed by sealing the cracks in the crater, mixing the plutonium contaminated soil with cement to form a slurry and pumping the slurry into the crater around the contaminated debris, thereby encasing all the radioactive materials in a solid mass. As terms such as sealing, encasing, and solid mass suggest, the final step of pouring concrete over radioactive waste was meant to be a form of containment. And as the use of the term entombment and later on crypt suggest, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and the U.S. military meant the step to be the death of radioactive waste, conveniently absolving themselves of future responsibility by claiming to have successfully ended everything through death and buried the results of their testing, and eventually the push, and eventually by pushing um, for Marshall East state autonomy so that they don't have to deal with the repercussions themselves. This is a conceptualization of life and matter as linear, as one having a definite point of death, echoing its myth of containment for islands that draws an imaginary boundary around the ecosystem of a given island to test the subjects. This exists in stark contrast to how the quote-unquote death of radioactive materials is actually measured. It is measured in a number of half-lives until they radio decay enough to be um, quote-unquote environmentally innocuous. In other words, radioactive materials do not die. They continue into theoretical eternity through half-lives. If these distance, isolation, containment, and death are the operating logic behind the US imperialism and militarism, um, behind both nuclear testing and waste cleanup, what Marshallese poet Kathy General Kitchener shows is an ontology of connection and relation against radi irradiation. Both self and body do not exist in a contained, isolated unit, but instead they exist in relation to others as a, in a web of being across the Pacific. In her poem, Fishbone Hair, General Kitchener tells the uh, story of her niece, Bianca, who passed away from leukemia. Her leukemia, however, isn't simply an isolated incident. The poet draws a parallel between her death sentence, which was she had six months to live, with um, what the doctors told the fishermen over 20 years ago when they were out at sea just miles away from Bikini the day the sun exploded, split open, and rained ash on the fishermen's clothes. Her niece Bianca's death draws a direct parallel with the Marshallese fishermen who bore witness to and experienced immediate radiation sickness, the very people who dusted the ash out of their hair. Bianca's love for fish and her varied ways of eating fish also draws a direct relation to her Marshallese fishermen ancestors. Uh, the poet's ontology of relation does not simply stop with fishermen ancestors here, however. She weaves a Chamorro legend into the poem and draws relations between Bianca and the woman of Guahan, also known as Guam, and between the Marshall Islands and Guahan. In doing so, she also builds a relation of resistance against U.S. imperialism and militarism, as Guahan is an unincorporated U.S. territory that lost a third of its land to the U.S. military as, as its base. This relationality expands, in, expands the being into a web of relations, map of resistance, and into a sea of islands, to borrow, uh, borrow from Haofa once again. Um, as such, Bianca, she exists through her relations. She exists as the poet's kin, the progeny of fishermen who experience acute radiation sickness in relation to other Pacific Island peoples and communities. Step, uh, stepping out of the poem as well, General Kitchener's poetry and anti-nuclear activism continues to build and expand the relations around Bianca. For instance, she regularly performs in Japan and participates in international anti-nuclear conferences, often performing this very poem, Fishbone Hair. Against the ruling logic of distance, isolation, and containment, the poet's niece continues to exist. Just as the Marshallese people continue to harvest and digest the fish and breadfruit despite radiation and continue to survive, 
Ontology of radiation digests imperial changes through continuing to build connections. The body isn't simply a contained body. It is one in connection with your kin, your people, and your larger community. This continued existence resists the lack of future that the ruling logic of US empire and military forces onto people, not simply through radiation, but also through global warming and rising sea levels. Against these forms of what Rob Nixon calls slow violence, I know we mentioned this before, um, Kathy General Kitchener tells the story of people who continue to survive through building relations and connections, of people who digest the waste materials for the empire that they that they're forcefully fed and survive. Lastly, the survival separates the future the U.S. empire and military will and the futurity that the poet envisions. The U.S. empire and military sees the future of conquering separated, contained lands and further creation and continuation of hierarchical and uneven distribution at the expense of toxic and disappearing lands and people. The poet, however, rejects the very premise of the U.S. empire. She rejects containment and reaches out, making connections and relations. She rejects disappearance and instead continues to survive and be. Thank you.